Joining us now is the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, who's in Michigan campaigning for the Republican ticket on his American Revival Tour. Uh, Speaker Johnson, thanks for joining us. Let's start with Israel. You spoke with Prime Minister Netanyahu yesterday. Um, the U.S. is right now investigating a leak of highly classified intelligence documents posted online that appear to show Israeli plans for a retaliatory strike against Iran. Um, what's the latest on the investigation into this leak, and what did your conversation with Netanyahu go like? How did that go? Yeah, the leak is very concerning. There's some serious allegations being made there. Investigation underway, and I'll get a briefing on that uh, in a couple of hours. Um, there's a classified level briefing and then other. But we're following it closely. Look, I, I talked to my friend BB, Prime Minister Netanyahu, yesterday uh, to encourage him. I mean, he's done an extraordinary job, I think, prosecuting that war. And if he had taken Joe Biden's advice, they'd be in a much weaker position right now. I think that the United States needs to stand unequivocally by our ally there right now. There is really, we're on a precipice, I think, Jake, of a, a new era of security and freedom for Israel. And uh, I think we're very close, I hope, I pray, to ending that conflict there. But we cannot equivocate. We can't appease Iran. Now is the time for a maximum pressure campaign against the head of the snake. It's not Hezbollah and Hamas and the proxies that are ultimately the threat. It is Iran itself. And I think we need to recognize that right reality right now. Is there any strike against the Iranians uh, by Israel that you think would be too much, that would risk escalating matters so much that the United States is actually pulled into the war directly? Uh, it's not my, my place to, to second-guess their strategy or try to micromanage it. I, I think that we uh, do harm to the overall cause if that's our position. And I think that's what uh, the Biden-Harris administration has tried to do at too many points along the way. They have withheld weapons systems when Congress, in a bipartisan manner, uh, duly enacted that these things would be supplied. And, uh, you know, I've had many uh, very serious, uh, deep conversations with administration officials over the previous months, urging them to do what, what Congress has voted to do. And I, I think in, in many ways they've kind of empowered Iran. I mean, look, President Trump is right when he says on the campaign trail that none of this happened under his watch. It didn't because we did not empower it. The Biden-Harris policies did. They relaxed sanctions on Iran, which allowed them to, uh, to, to have the resources and the, and the time and the opportunity to do what happened on October 7th, more than a year ago, that great atrocity and to continue all of this. So, look, we need to stand by Israel. This is a good versus evil conflict. It's not even close. Israel is a state. It is the most stable democracy in the Middle East. And Iran is a terrorist regime, and it works through terrorist organizations to do great harm to our allies. And ultimately, what they hope to do is to us. And that's a real threat to us right now as well. Let's turn to the 2024 race. Uh, you heard uh, President Trump's remarks. Let me read you the lead of the Associated Press story about Trump's rally in Pennsylvania. Quote, Donald Trump's campaign suggested he would begin previewing his closing argument Saturday night with Election Day barely two weeks away, but the former president kicked off his rally with a detailed story about Arnold Palmer, at one point even praising the late legendary golfer's genitalia, unquote. Mr. Speaker, you're crossing all over the country. You're working hard to get Republicans over the line in this election. You're talking about substantive issues. Is this really the closing message you want voters to hear from Donald Trump? Stories about Arnold Palmer's penis? Well, listen, I, I think that the headline that I read about the rally in, in, in Pennsylvania yesterday was the big question, and it's the one that Kamala Harris has not been able or willing to answer, and that is, are you better off now than you were under the Trump administration? four years ago. And no one can answer that question uh, with a yes. I mean, no one. And that's why Kamala Harris herself avoids the question. Look, I've, I've been traveling the country nonstop, Jake. I've been in over 230 cities and 40 states right now. And I'm spending this, these final closing weeks in the swing states, in blue states, in toss-up districts for the House. I'm absolutely convinced. There's an energy out there right now. I'm convinced that we are going to win the White House, the Senate, and the House. And we're going to have a very aggressive agenda to get the economy going again, to help everyone. Look, Look, everywhere I go, Jake, everybody has the same uh, concerns. They're fed up and they're fired up about the cost of living that's unaffordable now and the, the rising crime rates everywhere and the weakness on the world stage and the wide open border. And they know that Kamala Harris is responsible for those things. And they know that President Trump is offering alternatives. So put the rhetoric aside. Look at the record of these two candidates. This shouldn't be about 
personalities. It should be about policy. And I think people are looking at that seriously, and that's why I'm convinced we're going to win. I'm sure that you think that a policy debate would be better than a personality debate, but if President Biden had gone on stage and spoke about the size of a pro golfer's penis, I think you would be on this show right now saying you were shocked and appalled, and you would suggest it was evidence of his cognitive decline. I wonder how Trump's remarks, not just the one about Arnold Palmer on his, quote, manhood, but everything we've heard from Trump this week, how it fits in with the analysis that the New York Times offered a few days ago. They looked at his speeches from 2015 and 2016 and looked at his speeches today and said, quote, with the passage of time, the 78-year-old former president's speeches have grown darker, harsher, longer, angrier, less focused, more profane, and increasingly fixated on the past. Um, I know you want to talk about policy, and I respect that, but the reason that Donald Trump is not up 10 points is because of comments like that one, where people do have concerns about his fitness, his acuity, and his stability. Um, why is he talking about Arnold Palmer's penis in front of Pennsylvania voters? Jake, you seem to like that line a lot. Let me tell you that I Donald mention, Trump is I doing rallies me, nonstop me around the country. Let me just say something. <laughs> I don't want okay. to be talking about All this. Right. Donald Trump is out there saying it. It is. But you continue to. Let's talk because about. Because you, you won't address Wait a minute. it. Hold on. You won't address it. He is out there talking to no, voters. No, I'll address about... it. Let me, okay, let me answer it. Okay, don't say it again. We don't have to say it. I get it. There's, there's lines in a, in a rally. When President Trump is at a rally, sometimes he'll speak for two straight hours. You're, you're, you're questioning his stamina, his mental acuity. Joe Biden couldn't do that for five minutes. That's how you started this, this, uh, this segment. You said, what if Biden was in a rally like that? He couldn't fill the room. Donald Trump does. You know why? Because they see him as a change agent, and they understand he has a record of performance. In his first administration, we had the greatest economy in the history of the world, Jake, not just the U.S. Everybody's wages were going up. Everybody had more jobs available to them. The pathway out of poverty was widened for more people. And that's what the American people are looking at. We're going to have a demographic shift in this electorate, Jake. There's going to be, when they count the votes and they, they do the math on the other side of this, I'm convinced you're going to have a record number of Hispanic and Latino voters coming into the Republican Party, a record number of black and African American voters, record number of Jewish voters and union workers and, and, and hardworking families, because they understand the Harris policies have have destroyed their family finances they have made them less safe in their cities they have a wide open border with illegals and terrorists coming into our country this is not working for the american people they want to change and that's what they see in donald trump so he has fun at the rallies he says things that are off the cuff but i'm telling you i've been in those events i've been in those arenas and people have a great time at those arenas so you can cherry pick a you know a few words or lines out of a two-hour event we could do that with kamala harris after a 20 minute event because she does word salads and she couldn't she couldn't hold court like that without a teleprompter we all know that so, those are the facts the american people see it and you know the media can pick it apart but people are going to vote they're going to vote what's best for their family and they see that in trump in multiple interviews this week uh donald trump repeatedly referred to prominent democrats and others on the left in the united states american citizens as quote the enemy from within unquote and he suggested as president he would want to use the National Guard or military against them. Let me play some of that for our viewers. The bigger problem are the people from within. We have some very bad people. We have some sick people, radical left lunatics. And I think they're the and, and it should be very easily handled by, if necessary, by National Guard or if really necessary, by the military, uh, they, because they can't let that happen. One of the first things you did when you joined Congress was to create the Honor and Civility Caucus. Does wanting to use the military against political opponents, would that pass muster with the Civility Caucus? No, that's not... <laughs> Jake, you know that's not what he's talking about there. What he's talking about is marauding gangs of dangerous, nope. violent people who are destroying public property nope. he talked about and, Adam and Schiff threatening and other American he's citizens. He's not talking. Mean, uh, Governor Youngkin tried this with me too. That's not, he was very clear. Let, let me let me play because he was asked about this later on because Fox always likes to give Donald Trump an opportunity to clean it up, uh, and he always says, "No, no, I'm, I said what I meant." Here's what he said when asked about it uh, the next day. It is the enemy from within, and they're very dangerous. They're Marxists and communists and fascists, and they're sick. I use a guy like Adam Schiff because 
They made up the Russia, Russia, Russia hoax. It took two years to solve the problem. Absolutely nothing was done wrong, etc., etc. They're dangerous for our country. We have China, we have Russia, we have all these countries. If you have a smart president, they can all be handled. The more difficult are, you know, the Pelosi's, uh, these people, they're so sick and they're so evil. He's, that's what he's talking about, using the U.S. military against not marauding gangs of uh, Venezuelan. Wait, wait a minute. I, wait, Adam hold on. Schiff, Nancy Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi's husband. Paul. So let me just say, if a Democratic presidential candidate said that you and your wife were evil and that the military should be used against you, I would say that's disgusting. Well, thank you. And, and some have said that about us because they don't like my politics. I did not hear President Trump in that clip say he's going to sick the military on Adam Schiff. That's not what he's saying. You've got two different clips in two different contexts. What, what President Trump is talking about is that they have been attacking and maligning him from the day he came down that golden escalator. Everybody knows that's true. In, in 2015, 2016, that's when this began. He's been the most attacked maligned political figure in U.S. history. They've tried to kill him twice in the last few months. Who's I mean, they? this is real, and he feels that acutely. And, Jake, you what would, you too. They? If you were under attack like he is all the time, every day. They, I mean, Iran, who has assassination attempts sure. out against him. But I that's mean, not crazy, dangerous but people Adam in the Schiff country who and Nancy Pelosi get on are not trying and take to assassinate shots. Donald Trump. I mean, there's this conflation of any... They're not, Jake. They're, they're not. But... No, but the political attacks have been relentless, and they have been baseless, and they made up the Russian collusion hoax, and they went after him and have been going after him ever since. They tried to impeach him twice. I mean, they've done real damage in the in American psyche. What I'm talking about is the political attacks that are so over the top. Kamala Harris has used language saying he's so dangerous to the country. I mean, I've had colleagues in the House say he must be eliminated. He must be extinguished. He's literally I mean, talking about th this stuff is military over the top. You know my against Democrats. I mean, he's literally talking. No, he's about not. No, yes, he no, he's not, Jake. No, he's not. No, he's talking about using the National Guard and the military to keep the peace in our streets. In the summer of 2020 that my Democrat colleagues call the summer of love, it was crazy. It was mayhem. And Democratic progressive uh, mayors and governors allowed it to go on, including Tim Walz, who allowed uh, Minneapolis to burn and it's still not uh, rebuilt. Look, Trump is talking about restoring law and order. And I'm telling you, you can mock it. People in the media can mock it. But that resonates with the American people. They are sick of being afraid on the streets of their cities. D Donald Trump can bring order back to the chaos. They know that. So they're willing to give a little on his, you know, social if media he, posts if, if and some fun language he uses it. He at called rallies. January 6th a yeah. day of love. He said that the January 6th criminals, the, pri the, the prisoners who violently attacked your place of work, he compared to them to the victims of Japanese internment camps. And that guy is in favor of law and order? Yes, President Trump had and kept law and order. When he says at the campaign rallies that Except on we didn't sense. have hot wars around the globe during his administration. No, look, look he, he's, he's right. Russia did not invade Ukraine under his watch. Israel was not attacked viciously by Iran and its proxies because they were afraid to do so under our, that commander-in-chief, under President Trump. Uh, they're not afraid right now. Our, our allies are nervous. Our enemies are empowered because they see an opportunity. The only person that they fear less, our enemies abroad, the only person they fear less than Joe Biden is Kamala Harris. At the end of the day, when you go into the ballot box, I would just encourage everybody, ask yourself quietly, are you comfortable with Kamala Harris being the commander in chief of the U.S. Armed Forces at the most dangerous moment since World War II. She could not handle that. Our enemies would have an opportunity there, and people think about those things, and that's why they're going to vote for Donald Trump. It's like that's you why he's going to win and be reelected president. Answering questions from a completely different interviewer. Yeah. But, Speaker Johnson, I appreciate your time today. Uh, thank you so much, uh, and best of luck on the campaign trail in these last 16 days. I hope it is a peaceful, and successful election <laughs> and that all the ballots from legal voters are counted and that the actual winner takes office. That would be fantastic. Good to see you, Speaker Johnson. You too, my friend. Thanks so much.